talk. Um, and I work as a co-editor of one of the textbooks that will be mentioned. So the learning objectives that I'd like to achieve today is to give you all an appreciation of the relevance of altitude related disorders in medical practice, but also how that could be of significant relevance in spaceflight, then give you an understanding of the spectrum of altitude related illnesses, including diagnosis, treatment and prevention. Um, and give you a little bit of background here. What are some of the resources if you're interested in the specialty of aerospace medicine? It's a subspecialty of the American Board of Preventive Medicine. You know, a great resource is the Aerospace Medical Association. You know, they also have a student and resident uh, group that is very active. And here are some of the key, key textbooks, Fundamentals of Aerospace Medicine, then Principles of Clinical Medicine for Space Flight, and Ernsting's Aviation Medicine. Now, I mentioned that um, aerospace medicine, we all think of when I say aerospace medicine, everybody thinks of the astronaut. But the reality is that our scope of what we do is much broader. So we do space medicine, yes, but we also do aviation medicine. And we also do a lot of environmental and extreme medicine. So basically low oxygen environments, environments of uh, decreased ambient pressure. And that is really where these two topics are going to intersect. So when you think about this physiologically, you know, you have um, in terrestrial environments on the left side of this slide, uh, altitude illnesses primarily governed by the changes in ambient pressure due to Dalton's law. They can be acute or chronic. So it's primarily an oxygen and a carbon dioxide problem. During rapid ascent to altitude, so in an aerospace environment, we're dealing with additional gas loss due to the lack of equilibration or quick equilibration, and that is Henry's law begetting decompression sickness or uh, aviator bends, then dysbaric symptoms, so trapped gases, that's Boyle's law, and then also hypoxia. So here it's really a nitrogen pressure, volume, oxygen, and CO2 problem. So how is it, you know, that space, um, a, uh, a uh, astronaut picture would have any place in altitude medicine? Well, it actually does have a space. And the reason for that is because when you think about exploration class missions, when we're trying to get people to go safely to Mars, it's going to be a matter of how much can you carry with you? And that includes how much of your own atmosphere are you going to be able to carry with you? So there's currently discussions about what will that atmosphere be? It would make precious little sense to create an atmosphere in a space vehicle that is 14.7 PSI or sea level pressure that we have here on Earth, but rather go to a lesser ambient bomb pressure because that will beget uh, less volume and less need for pressurization and with that strain of the aircraft and consumables. But that's an ongoing discussion. How much is enough and how much is too little and what will it do to the human body? So some of the things that we've learned in altitude medicine will become germane and will be important discussions even during exploration class missions. So the Mayo Clinic has three locations, and I happen to be at the one here in Scottsdale and Phoenix in Arizona. And um, it's a running joke almost when people ask me, so you run the altitude clinic for the institution. At what elevation is your altitude clinic? And, you know, it's at 1,600 feet. And you would think, well, how is it possible that you would have people who have problems with altitude related problems uh, at 1600 feet? Well, we have 4 million people in our lower Sonoran Desert here in the metropolis of Phoenix and Tucson and surrounding cities. And the only way out of the hell called summer um, to get some relief is going to be to go to altitude. So you have a scenario where people who are not acclimatized don't live at altitude, go to recreate at altitude and get there quickly by driving within a couple of hours. You can easily be at seven, eight, ten thousand feet. So we see a lot of patients. I would like you to take, I'm not going to torture you with the gas laws, um, but I would like you to uh, remember this very slide because I think it really brings home the importance of how quickly and how big the changes are in pressure when you go up in the atmosphere. 
And the biggest changes really happen in the lowermost portions of the atmosphere. So per 10,000 feet, you get a significant um, pressure change. Whereas when you are going from 50 to 60,000 feet, it is a minuscule change because of just the structure of the atmosphere as a haystack. So at 8,000 feet, you have a 25% decrease in ambient pressure, 18,000 feet is 50% thereof, and then 34% uh, at 34,000 feet, 75% decrease in ambient pressure. So we deal very regularly with 25 to 30% decrease in ambient pressure and the resulting changes that people experience in their physiology. So why should you care? Or why is this important? Well, it's important because when you look at the incidence of mountain sickness in a variety of scenarios, you know, notably here, Colorado in the United States, 25% of individuals who travel there and go to recreate experience some form of mountain sickness upon arrival. If you are flown to 14,000 feet, um, you know, you're guaranteed that you're going to get mountain sickness. But if you're at lower elevations or you have more gradual ascent, then the percentages are lesser. The more severe forms of altitude illness, high altitude pulmonary edema and cerebral edema are fortunately rarer, and they're also contingent on the elevation. So, you know, how quickly can people get to the high altitude environment will drive the incidence. Don't forget, and this is an important thing for me because many a times when people think of altitude medicine as um, being basically taking care of people who are super fit, who want to run up Kilimanjaro or they want to go to Everest Base Camp or they do these incredible treks. Well, most people that turn out these days want to go to recreate um, have some sort of background medical history. And you'll be surprised to see that a lot of disorders that are very common in clinical practice um, have a marked influence and are very sensitive to oxygen changes gotten as a result of decreased ambient pressure, i.e. altitude. Sleep disorders are important to highlight, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, you know, even hypertension and what drugs um, respond well and are good to manage blood pressure at altitude versus are not. Seizure spells, headaches, you know, autonomic nervous system disorders, um, glaucoma and the management of glaucoma is an important one. Um, obviously, sickle cell disorders are notorious for that, but even good old fashioned anemias of variety of causes are obviously going to decrease your oxygen carrying capacity at altitude. Um, there is a variety of conditions that are very common in clinical practice, take that away, that are influenced at altitude. And many people who travel to altitude are going to be the patients that you see in clinic. So what is the spectrum of altitude illnesses? You know, so you have the benign, relatively annoying, but not um, more than that mountain sickness upon arrival when you go too fast, too high. Then you can have more severe symptoms that can penultimately result in high altitude cerebral edema and pulmonary edema is the most serious version. And there's other things such as high altitude retinal hemorrhages, periodic breathing at altitude, um, or Paul Auerbach's, he coined the high altitude flatus expulsion, you know, the increase um, in abdominal distension courtesy of gaining altitude, you now know is Boyle's law. The timeline of you know when these disorders arise, and this is there is not perfect data for this, but the bottom line is that upon arrival to altitude, very quickly within a couple of hours, you can start feeling headachey, dizzy, and mildly short of breath, and that can be just regular mountain sickness. High altitude pulmonary edema immediately upon arrival at altitude is exceptionally rare. You know, so typically it turns out to take a couple of days, you know, until people get that 24 to 48 hours and high altitude cerebral edema also turns out to be somewhat delayed. So it's not the first presentation. This is important because you always need to keep in mind what is your differential. So if someone has shortness of breath and, you know, they are coughing and they're feeling unwell and they're tachypneic, there's other things that can happen at altitude the same way that they can happen in the lowlands. And those are things like pulmonary emboli or good old fashioned pneumonia. So just because you're at altitude, not everything is altitude disease. And keeping this in mind, especially early on to differentiate is important.
Now, when we think about adaptation to altitude, you know, there's a couple of rules of thumb. Rules of thumb are notoriously bad because they're usually based on data, you know, that you don't want to rely on too heavily, but it makes for something that allows you to put your arms around it. So in order to acclimatize to a given altitude, 80%, you know, is accomplished within 10 days. And that's basically perfectly adapting. Within six weeks, you accomplish 95% at a given altitude. And you can partially lose acclimatization if you spend more than a week at lower elevation. So in other words, you can spend time at 14,000 feet being perfectly acclimatized, then spend a week at sea level, go back and experience mountain sickness. The term death zone is a term used for an elevation above which there is no physiologic long-term compensation possible. So basically your body goes in a catabolic state, people start losing muscle, they're start, starting to lose weight, and you cannot, um, or for a prolonged period of time, live and stay and be well at that elevation. Periodic breathing at altitude is something that is a normal adaptation of our bodies to the decreased ambient pressure. So when you uh, look at periodic breathing at altitude, which is, you know, the tracing up here showing you the expiration and the inspiration. So you can see the periodicity of breathing in, breathing out, and then not breathing. You know, that is something that is part of the adaptation of your respiratory center to the decreased ambient pressure. And with that, trying to reset to the needs of how frequently should you be breathing um, in light of the ambient oxygen and your CO2 levels. If you give people oxygen, you can abolish that. Um, and if you give people acetazolamide, which is a, um, a carbohydrate inhibitor, which induces a mild metabolic acidosis, that will also regulate your breathing. And as a result of that, regulate your respirations and maintain your oxygen saturations. Um, this here is a placebo, so you can see the beautiful um, periodic breathing patterns. You can see this very accentuated also in people uh, who have heart failure when they go to altitude or individuals with sleep disorders. This is an example of a study you know, that uh, we did some years back where you see ventilatory adaptation at uh, altitude and simulated here um, at sea level with just a hypoxic gas mixture. And you can see the classic chain stokes um, breathing patterns. And here is actually the, uh, not the simulation, but the in-field recording. And you can see also the very pronounced chain stokes breathing and decreases in oxygen saturations. So, Common sense is that in order to get mountain sickness, you need to go fast and you need to sleep at high elevation. And the altitude typically exceeds 2000 meters. Uh, individual factors play into this. So, you know, have you had previous incidents of um, altitude related disorders? Most notably and uh, reproducibly would be high altitude pulmonary edema. You know, do you happen to reside in the lowlands to begin with? Are you young or are you older? You know, there is an advantage to aging because there is a notion that um, mountain sickness could be tied to some of the um, subtle swelling of the brain tissue, which when you happen to be older, you have more atrophy, so you have more room to swell, whereas someone who happens to be young turns out to get symptoms quicker. Um, women tend to be less susceptible to pulmonary edema, and if you happen to be very overweight, that puts you at risk probably through pathways um, akin to alterations in breathing and sleep alterations. So here are the risk categories. When I see someone in consultation, what we usually try is we try to sort out, you know, are you at low risk, you know, and can you uh, get by with just acclimatization or are you moderate or high risk? And with that, do you need more than just going gradually um, up the mountain? Would you potentially benefit from medicines that can be prescribed? What are key things to watch out for? And this is an important takeaway slide. So if you yourself feel hungover, you feel that you're even when you're taking a break, your respiratory rate exceeds 20 per minute, you feel subjectively breathless, you feel nauseous, you know, your appetite is gone. And especially, you know, when you start losing um, balance, you start tripping, you know, that's something that should get your attention because that can be the distinction between good old fashioned mountain sickness and the beginnings of cerebral edema. 
and excessive fatigue. This is the type of fatigue where even if you take a break, you don't feel like you're getting your steam back as you usually would during exercise at your hometown elevation. What is it that you want to watch out for in your peers? So when you're in a uh, hiking group, you usually know where people are and they come in first and walk up front or in the middle or towards the end. So if they now all of a sudden, when they used to be the first ones in the group, now they're falling behind and they're struggling at arriving last, pay attention to that. If they struggle with tasks that usually come easy to them, that's something important to keep in mind. If they start to stumble um, or if they start skipping meals, and also importantly, if someone gets to be more irritable, more antisocial and starts to behave more erratically than they usually would, um, pay attention to that because that can also be a subtle hint that they're not feeling well. So when we do a high altitude consultation for patients, when we see them, what we usually do is we try to risk stratify and try to get a sense of, well, why are you coming? So. Have you had problems in the past? You know, what is your itinerary? What's your past history? What comorbid conditions do you have? How could those comorbid conditions potentially impact you and with that mar your experience? You know, what's your fitness level? You know, do you have any additional testing that will be warranted? So for some individuals, we sometimes do um, hypoxic um, echoes when we are interested in seeing what their pulmonary arterial pressures do, or if they start to shunt right to left when they get to be hypoxic. And we try to educate all of our patients on the signs of mountain sickness, pulmonary edema, and cerebral edema. We give them guidance with regards to the medications and also disease specific guidance, you know, depending on their history. And we always highlight, make sure you check and make sure you have evacuation insurance because in case they don't, that could, you know, get them quickly in the poor house. So let's talk about mountain sickness. So mountain sickness is the most common occurrence that many, if not most of you may have experienced already when traveling to high altitude. It's typically feeling somewhat nauseous, blah, fatigued, lightheaded, sleep is nothing to write home about and you have a headache. Typical and currently accepted uh, scoring system is the Lake Louise scoring system. An alternative one would be the environmental symptom questionnaire. Um, typically, the risk factors are fast ascent, but also individual susceptibility. Some people just don't do well and they get predictably mountain sick every single time they go to elevation. The treatment here would be rest, you know, give them time to acclimatize to a given elevation. You can give them some acetazolamide, which will enhance their respiratory adaptation to altitude. You can give them some non steroidals, things like ibuprofen will decrease the headache and make them feel better. If they're feeling really badly and you have discretionary oxygen, you can give it to them. But on a mountain, typically you don't have extra oxygen. So I would spare that for more severe cases or you could give them hyperbaria. So basically a excess pressure surrounding them, which will simulate descent and will make them feel better. So here's the Lake Louis scoring system. So basically it consists in a self-assessment, you know, with headache, GI symptoms, fatigue, and dizziness. The most recent iteration of the scoring system now omits sleep quality. Then you have the clinical assessment there. You primarily want to have a focus on catching a tax here because that would sort the individual with just regular mountain sickness and the one who happens to have uh, cerebral edema. And then you have the functional score. So, you know, how did these symptoms affect your activities? And if they affect them a lot, then it's probably significant. So here's a case for you, 46 year old male on a trek from 1500 meters to 3,650 meters in two days. On the way up in the rain, he begins to feel unwell, you know, no appetite, fatigue, a little bit of shortness of breath and nausea and some vomiting. And at 3,650 meters, he becomes unconscious. Uh, what is this? Any ideas? So, um, you know, on Zoom, that's always awkward and weird. Um, but um, I will cut this to the chase, you know, the um, uh, symptoms here would certainly speak for some aspects of mountain sickness, the shortness of breath, you know, that could, you know, in the right scenario, especially if they happen to have cough and, you know, productive sputum and tachypnea, that could speak for pulmonary edema. The unconsciousness, you know, gives this away as being much more than just that. You know, this most likely is high altitude cerebral edema. And here is an actual scenario. So you can see early on, you can see the 
edema forming in the splenium of the corpus callosum in the white matter and you know then later becomes diffused this individual was evacuated to a hospital was comatose on arrival was responsive only to pain had papal edema and retinal hemorrhages and also bilateral pulmonary crackles respiratory rate was 40 heart rate 120 and there was fever csf pressure was elevated and this individual unfortunately didn't do well and died four days later and you would argue justifiably well you know if there's pulmonary crackles that are present and this individual happens to be febrile you know febrile reactions can be seen in both cerebral and pulmonary edema and frequently cerebral pulmonary edema and mountain sickness can overlap and be present in the same individual so it's not that they have either or oftentimes you know people have a combination of these when you do autopsy, what you will find is um, cerebral edema, typically in a vasogenic distribution, but also occasional hemorrhages and vessels with small fiber and thrombi. And um, as mentioned, it's vasogenic as opposed to cytotoxic edema. Um, typically, this is very, very rare, less than 10,000 feet. Um, and the um, mantra here is if you have someone who is feeling unwell, has a headache, is nauseous, and is now losing their balance, you want to really get them down as quickly as you can. And the reason for that is a selfish reason, because if you don't, then before you know it, they may not be ambulatory, and then you have to carry them. And, you know, that will take about 10 people, you know, to carry an individual down the mountain safely. And so with that, it just blew up your expedition. You can consider giving them right away dexamethasone. You can give them a hyperbaric uh, treatment in a bag, in a gum of bag. You can give them oxygen. The intent of hyperbaria here is primarily to make this individual who is um, on the verge of being non-ambulatory or not safe to ambulate, ambulatory again so they can descend the mountain on their own two feet. Now let's take a look at a second case. So here is a mountaineer carrying gear to base camp from 6,500 to 7,000 meters, so up to 23,000 peak altitude. No appetite, nauseous, headache, next morning short of breath, tachycardic and also a dry cough, fast breathing. The cough becomes frothy and blood tinged and that should give it away you know the predominant respiratory symptoms you know will show you that this is suspicious for primary pulmonary syndrome and so this really is most likely hay could it be a viral illness yes it could but you would want to assume you know the worst because if you don't treat these people with descent and proper lowering of the pulmonary arterial pressures they can do very poorly so that's high altitude pulmonary edema and you know what we did what was done with this patient you know this patient was placed in a hyperbaric bag given some oxygen the individual improved and was able to descend you know to the closest clinic and in two days he was improved and was well again so this is the baseline x-ray this is pulmonary edema right side predominant patchy uh, distribution pulmonary edema with some prominence of the um, pulmonary artery now, this here is probably hard to read on a zoom screen, but the intent here is to show you that the lack of oxygen at altitude comes um, courtesy of uh, Dalton's law, so the decrease in partial pressure. That will increase your sympathetic nerve activity, which in turn will result in pulmonary blood volume increases, overperfusion in local uh, regional uh, areas of the lung, also will impact pulmonary venous constriction, and that in turn will increase the capillary pressure and capillary leakage will occur. And this is what is felt to be the root cause for high altitude pulmonary edema, which will in turn create more hypoxemia. And basically there is interactions that um, sell feet and make this worse over time. Here is a picture from John West um, on his uh, rabbit lung model where he perfused the pulmonary arterial um, circulation at higher pressures and showed in a rabbit model that the red cells actually are crossing from the capillary into the alveolus. So this is called capillary um, stress failure and is felt to be the reason for the pulmonary edema that we see at high altitude. So the signs and symptoms here that are important is shortness of breath, you know, confusion, you know, fast heart rate, 
And, you know, this is different from the fast heart rate and the fast breathing that you get when you have an individual working. So when you're working, you're walking, it's normal, you know, you have increased tissue oxygen demand and you're going to be working harder. But typically, if you take a break and you sit down, your tachycardia commensurate to your tissue oxygen demand and your work demand will go down and so will your shortness of breath and so will, will your tachypnea. This is different. These people have unrelenting, persistent dyspnea, cough. They have um, very fast heart rate out of proportion to what they appear to be doing. And, you know, they have um, breathing rates that exceed 30, 40 easy. So the risk factors here clearly is prior episodes of HAPE. We talked about the potential genetic disposition that can be there. Obviously, rapid ascent and combined with vigorous exercise can do that. And the goal here is, again, get them off the mountain as long as they're ambulatory. If you have a hyperbaric bag in order to help them out, you can use that. You know, if you have oxygen, give them oxygen. You can give them calcium channel blockers. Um, or phosphodiesterase inhibitors in order to lower the pulmonary arterial pressures. Really well established are the calcium channel blockers. You know, nitric oxide no one has in the field and phosphodiesterase inhibitors don't work uh, equally well for everybody. So, you know, the calcium channel blockers are probably going to be your best bet. Here's another case, a healthy 28-year-old man traveling from Ohio to Denver and then to Breckenridge, you know, 9,600 feet. Uh, individual wanted to go skiing six hour after, uh, hours after the, they got there. He complains of headache, fatigue, mild temperature, and a persistent cough with minimal frothy sputum. He decides to go to bed early because he thinks he has a viral bug. You know, when you look at this, you could easily say, well, this could be just, you know, maybe a little bit of mountain sickness, you know, maybe an upper respiratory tract infection. But it turns out that this individual actually did have um, pulmonary edema and that individual, uh, otherwise young, healthy individual, did not wake up in the morning. Um, you know, this is not a common occurrence, but if you talk to the coroners um, and the um, uh, forensic uh, groups that uh, do autopsies in different jurisdictions in the Mountain West, this happens. You know, this was the autopsy finding of the lungs of this individual revealing just pink intraalveolar fluid without evidence of any chronic pulmonary pathology. So, you know, this was indeed high altitude pulmonary edema. High altitude retinal hemorrhages are incredibly common, you know, so if you go to um, significant elevation, your know, fundus is going to start looking like this. So you have these um, hemorrhages and as long as they are not close to the macula, you will not have any symptoms. Um, they are typically arteriolar. They typically self-clear within one to two weeks after you've come back to uh, lower elevation. If you go to 7,500 meters, you know, 90% of people will have retinal hemorrhages. So the best solution is to probably not try to look inside people's eyes at very high altitude unless you have a really good reason because you're going to spook yourself. You know, when we talked about hyperbaria and hyperbaric therapy, you know, the idea here is that you put people in an inflatable um, rubber enclosure with a zipper that you operate a foot pump in. And as a result of that, you can create a pressure differential of two PSI across the skin of that device. And that will be akin to going down the mountain. So you will be able to improve you know, the oxygenation and how people feel. The problem and the reason why this is not widely used unless you are on a large expedition is because this is a little bit like doing CPR with your foot. You know, it's very, very taxing. It takes a long time and you don't have access to your patient. You know, so if you're trying to help someone out who happens to have cerebral edema or pulmonary edema, they're going to be in that bag for two to four to four to six hours. Um, and, you know, if they're starting to feel worse or, you know, they start vomiting, you know, you will need to get them out of the bag because you cannot access the patient and take care of them. So the treatment for mountain sickness, you know, as little as 500 meters of going down uh, the mountain will make a difference. If you have oxygen, yeah, you can give them oxygen, but typically it's a very scarce commodity on a mountain, so that will rarely be the case. Um, 
uh, acetaminophen or compazine you can give people if they have a lot of nausea, but, you know, usually not necessary, you know, an ibuprofen or a Tylenol will do and some rest. You can give dexamethasone, you know, if you um, don't have anything else, but it's a bigger gun that is needed for mountain sickness. Um, acetazolamide is something that you can start giving people and that will give them relief as well. The hyperbaric bag, you know, one to two hours and typically people feel much better afterwards. When we talk about acetazolamide, so I mentioned to you already that acetazolamide will lead to increased loss of bicarb through the kidneys and will result as a result of that in a mild metabolic acidosis, which in turn will stimulate the respiratory center to breathe sufficiently for your needs. It also has interestingly aquaporin one and four channel inhibition qualities, so it regulates brain water. Um, and really the goal of giving people something like diamox or methazolamide, um, acetazolamide is to accelerate their respiratory acclimatization. Um, it really normalizes ventilation. So I'm not a fan of talking about diamox as a respiratory stimulant because that's really a misnomer. What it does is if you hypoventilate, it will improve your ventilation into the normal range. And if you ventilate to excess, it will bring down your ventilation so you're breathing in a normal range. So it's a regulator, really. People tend to sleep better. Um, they tend to have also very noteworthy numbness sensations when you're on this and it's dose dependent. There's also some individual um, predisposition. Some individuals don't have this. Most people do. Um, the food that you have, especially anything carbonated, will have a metallic aftertaste. Um, you know, best description that I've heard is that it tastes a little bit after having a sip of carbonated water, like you're licking a rusty steel pole, and that is actually a very good description. Um, even though this is a drug that does have a sulfa moiety, don't be alarmed and don't um, withhold this drug from patients who have a history of sulfa allergy. There is no cross-reactivity between sulfa antibiotics and um, between the sulfa moiety that is contained in acetazolamide or methazolamide. So you can safely give it to them. When we talk about treatment uh, for high altitude cerebral edema, it's really going down the mountain. So you really want to go down, you know, your oxygen, you know, you, you can give them oxygen, but the key thing here is get them out of the danger zone as best as you can. You will want to give them dexamethasone and ideally in the beginning don't waste the dexamethasone by giving them by mouth but give them dexamethasone iv and um, or im contingent on what uh, you're comfortable with and what uh, equipment you have and then subsequent to that switch to im and then po every six hours um, acetazolamide is smart in this instance as well because frequently people who have cerebral edema also have some uh, level and degree of mountain sickness, so you're not going to go wrong with doing that, but this by itself will not be enough. Hyperbaria, four to six hours in the bag, will certainly improve the symptoms, but what you want to do is, as soon as they're feeling better, use them feeling better to go down the mountain. Don't wait for them um, to get sick again, because they will. With HAPE, it's similar, so you really want to get these people off the mountain because um, HAPE and HACE are the two entities that can kill uh, your patient. If you have oxygen available, you know, try to be sparing as best as you can in order to maintain reasonable oxygenation. Um, you can give them a calcium channel blocker like nifedipine, you know, 30 milligrams extended release twice a day. Um, and, you know, then you can go to 20 milligrams by mouth every eight hours. If people have a history of pulmonary edema and I encourage them to carry nifedipine, I tell everybody to try how it makes them feel and take a test dose when they're still at home. You know, that way they know whether it really drops their blood pressure and would make it unsafe uh, to use um, and, you know, how dizzy they are when they are on this medicine. If you have suspicion that someone has a combination of HAPE and HAZE at the same time, you can give them dexamethasone, of course, and hyperbaria for this condition will be about four hours. So with preventive medications, what you want to do, 
Acetazolamide has been studied and the lowest effective dose is 125 milligrams by mouth twice a day to three times a day. Usually you start about a day before and you continue one to three days at your target altitude and then you can stop taking it. Um, the individual is going to be different. Some individuals will need more 250 BID up to 750 milligrams per, per day have been studies and have been found to be effective. Um, dexamethasone, you can use that as prophylaxis for AMS as well. If someone, for instance, cannot take acet acetazolamide, you know, you can use two milligrams by mouth every six hours um, at uh, during the ascent and at altitude. But the key thing here, you're not going to get the benefit from the respiratory adaptation that the acetazolamide will convey. So once you stop after having been on dexamethasone at altitude, you can have recurrence of symptoms of mountain sickness. You can use ibuprofen. You know, there is one study that has shown that ibuprofen was effective um, to decrease mountain sickness. You know, that is something that at this point in time is still being kicked around and uh, debated whether this is real or not. You know, I always struggle a little bit with trying to give a analgesic such as ibuprofen for a condition where one of the cardinal symptoms for diagnosis turns out to be a headache. Um, for HAEP, we already touched on that. You want to give them nifedipine um, every 12 hours and then subsequent to that 20 milligrams by mouth every eight hours. You can give them Tadalafil, but again, not everybody will respond to these phosphodiesterase inhibitors. And then with Hays, preventive medications would be dexamethasone, um, so AMS, basically the prophylaxis, acetazolamide, and the dexamethasone. The key thing here is common sense. You know, most cases of significant altitude illness could be prevented if people would be a little bit more self-reflective and a little bit more cautious. So if you have a headache, you do not want to be taking that headache higher. If you cannot walk a straight line and if you're losing your balance, then you have no business going up, you have business going down. If you are dehydrated or overexerted and if you're hypothermic, nothing good will happen. You know, try to climb high and sleep low, take time to ascend as best as you can. But the reality for all of us these days is that, you know, we have uh, limited time to spend and, you know, we want to back that peak and as a result of that um, people find themselves sometimes in uh, positions where they go high too fast and suffer the consequences. We talked about the hyperbaria so that's basically the gum of back the inflation of uh, bubble of increased pressure around the individual who is struggling with the condition. You know the key thing here is that really it's to make someone who's non-ambulatory ambulatory and then that person can be assisted down the mountain by maybe two helpers as opposed to having to have 10 to 12 people carry someone down the mountain if you have a large expedition and you're at higher elevations so over 15,000 feet this is probably worthwhile these things are not heavy but they're really hard to be pumping because you need to keep pumping in order for the individual to get fresh air and to maintain the pressure differential. So when we talk about slow ascent, what is a rule of thumb? You know, so the above 3000 meters, the sleeping altitude should not be more than 300 meters of the previous night. Try to have a rest day every couple of two to three days. You know, if you have symptoms, if you don't feel well, don't keep going higher, you know, wait until you're feeling better. And certainly try to avoid uh, rapid transport to over 10,000 feet because you will pay the price for it. What is pre-acclimatization? So pre-acclimatization basically is the concept of trying to use time to acclimatize on a mountain in the hopes of traveling to and climbing yet a bigger mountain. And, you know, if you do that, you know, over several days or, you know, at least exposures of significant duration um, to elevations of over 2,200 meters, you will get some good ventilatory acclimatization. Um, so six days at 2,200 meters, which is, you know, Flagstaff elevation here in Arizona, will put you in a much better position to not have mountain sickness when you ascend to 4,300 meters. I remember, you know, when I was um, uh, the medical team lead for um, one of the Kilimanjaro expeditions that Mayo did, 
Um, I really pre-acclimatized by spending time in Santa Fe and every morning running up uh, the peaks around the ski basin there. And that worked beautifully and I did great. So that pre-acclimatization really worked. The key thing here is trying to minimize the time between spending the time pre-acclimatizing and your actual climb, because the more time is in between, the more you lose that benefit. So when you are looking at sending someone to a colleague who does altitude medicine, who would you send? You know, it's typically people who've struggled before, you know, especially the ones that had pulmonary edema because they may have an abnormality of their pulmonary arterial circulation. You know, people who've had cerebral edema, you want to be very, very sure that, you know, it's going to be safe for them to go and that they also have the wherewithal and the medicines that are needed in order to prophylax if needed. Um, and also get them a sense of, you know, what is it that they're in for and that they're educated. You know, if they have complex medical conditions, so if someone has um, hypertension, history of heart disease, sleep apnea, and now wants to go uh, climb Kilimanjaro, this is not a standard travel consultation. You know, there may be need for additional thought and review and potentially even additional testing. Any oxygen sensitive disorders should perk your ears up to make sure that you're not missing an opportunity to advocate for your patient, whether that person is safe to go or not. Avoid aggressive ascent schedules, especially in austere environments. Everybody wants to get up to that mountain and to the peak as quickly as they can. The problem is that, you know, if you do, you might be paying a price for it. So when we see someone, what we usually do is we do the risk stratification, then we talk about acclimatization strategies, what medications should they consider. Sometimes when it's warranted, we can do high altitude simulation testing. So it's basically inhaled uh, reduced gas, uh, reduced oxygen mixtures uh, together, for instance, with a echocardiogram or other forms of imaging to get a sense of what's happening, for instance, with someone who has congenital heart disease or someone where we're worried about their pulmonary arterial pressures, that can be quite helpful. Now let's talk about some clinical conditions. And I know that I have about three minutes left here before we get to the 10 minute mark before we're um, done and over uh, our time. So keep in mind that hypertension is something blood pressure at altitude will be out of whack. And it will, you know, recalibrate back um, to a more nominal level, but it will take time. You have an increased sympathoadrenal tone at altitude. That's part of your adaptation process. And as a result of that, not all drugs are going to be working equally well. If you still have patients for blood pressure and beta blockers, you know, if anything, please see to it that they are on selective beta blockers versus non-selective beta blockers. Calcium channel blockers and um, angiotensin receptor blockers tend to work very well, beta blockers less so. You'll be shocked to see that asymptomatic blood pressures on someone who gets to altitude and has a systolic of less than 120 and diastolic less than 140, that sounds outrageously high and would raise blood pressure in just looking at it, but turns out that this is something that is okay to someone who's asymptomatic. If someone is symptomatic, then these readings are going to be, and the numbers are going to be much, much lower. Heart disease, the key thing with heart disease is trying to make the distinction, is this stable, is it unstable? You know, do they have any risk factors, recent symptoms and recent interventions? So if someone is low risk overall, you know, they're stable, they're active and have not had any recent interventions, then they're going to be okay to go. If on the ups, on the other side, they are unstable, meaning that they have recent symptoms, recent interventions, they're usually inactive, they're not physically active, then this would be someone where you would be well advised to advise them to hold on altitude travel. Usually, you know, with anyone who has a history of heart disease, tell them to tone down their activity in the first 24 to 48 hours because that's the time when your respiratory system and your sympathoadrenal drive adjusts the most. Continue any treatment that was baseline treatment um, at their uh, home altitude of residence. And if they've had recent intervention, so let's say they had a stent placed, you know, uh, two months ago, probably wouldn't be unreasonable to consider a functional study, so a stress test. Um, but the key thing here is, you know, make sure that these people know what they're in for.
And this is an image of uh, Conrad Anker. You know, Conrad was the uh, climbing expert on our Himalaya, uh, on our uh, Kilimanjaro expedition. And he's a great example. And this is, you know, not, I'm not, you know, stating something that is not out in uh, the public um, eye. You know, he is a world renowned climber and mountaineer. And he suffered a vascular event, an ischemic cardiac event, when climbing in the Himalayas. So just because you're fit, just because you're doing it all the time, doesn't mean that things can't happen. Arrhythmias, you know, there is unfortunately not in all domains good data to really base good judgment on. Um, so with cardiac arrhythmias, you would think that if you go into an environment where your body will uh, increase sympathoadrenal tone, that would be arrhythmogenic. And as a result of that, you would want to be careful. You know, dehydration is also a factor. Poor sleep is a factor. Blood pressure oscillations are a factor. So it's not that they can't go, but this would warrant wanting to make sure that these people have a good sense of, well, how severe of an arrhythmia is this? Is this the rare and occasional supraventricular tachyarrhythmia that is barely symptomatic? Or is this someone who happens to have a um, AICD and decreased EF and has had episodes of ventricular tachycardia? That's a very different discussion. Contraindications for altitude travel. So severe valvular disease, severe valvular disease, you know, you should not go because the changes in pulmonary arterial pressures will result in alterations um, in uh, the pressure across valves on the right side of the heart. And uh, if you cannot mount an increased cardiac output in the face of hypoxia, this is just too high risk. If you've had a PE in the last three months, you should also not travel to altitude. Obviously, if you have cyanotic heart disease, you know, you're shunting, you know, that would be made worse at altitude due to the increases in pulmonary arterial pressures. If you have an ICD placed in the last three to six months, not a good idea. In the last three to six months, stroke, TIA, or CNS hemorrhage, you shouldn't be on a mountain. And if you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, so pulmonary arterial pressure is greater than 30, you know, those would be criteria to not go to altitude because the hypoxemia of altitude is going to increase pulmonary arterial pressures yet more. Liver disease, you know, liver disease here, you know, the key thing is uh, you can actually get hepatopulmonary syndrome and impaired gas exchange. You know, those are things that can be aggravated, worsened at altitude. So if someone has severe liver disease, it's a key thing to look into and make sure that you don't miss this. These people deserve ABGs. And they should never be on acetazolamide. So if someone has liver disease, don't, don't give them acetazolamide. And what I will do now is because we're running into um, the last 10 minutes here, I'll take a break um, and we'll open it up for Q&A. All right, so far we have two questions. Um, the first one is how do you differentiate the confusion of HAPE with the confusion of AMS aside from the predominant pulmonary symptoms? Good question. And you know, sometimes it's hard, you know, if you, have to treat something you're going to be treating for what is the potentially most dangerous. So if you have um, someone who is mildly confused um, or dizzy and lightheaded, and that person also happens to be short of breath and they turn out to have pulmonary crackles, and if you look at their oximeter, it is way off, then you would assume that this is due to um, high altitude pulmonary edema and treat accordingly and accordingly aggressively. If on the flip side, it turns out that uh, that person from a pulmonary standpoint looks okay and you think that this is not pulmonary edema, then you can take a crack and see what happens with uh, mountain sickness. But the distinction is not always easy. You know, sometimes it's the response to therapy that uh, gives you the answer. So if, you know, they were short of breath and they were not feeling well and, you know, you take them down the mountain a little bit and they feel immediately better, you know, it's a different story. If you have someone who has mountain sickness symptoms and you give them a little bit of oxygen, you know, they're going to feel a little bit better, but someone who has pulmonary edema is going to feel strikingly better. 
right. I the second question that I have is, do you know or have you heard of any plants used that help with altitude sickness? Oh, so you know there was uh, studies with ginkgo biloba, which have basically not really panned out um, for it to be a um, reliable and good um, measure to decrease mountain sickness or prevent mountain sickness. Um, there have been um, clearly anecdotally in the highlands of uh, South America use of coca leaves. People chew coca leaves and they swear by it. Um, not aware of um, any trials that were done that actually would result in medically valid data uh, to show that that makes a difference. It's about the extent of um, um, plants or plant supplements that I'm aware of. Great. And then uh, I have a third question here. Um, uh, this says, I know you have covered some of this, but do you have any specific recommendations for someone who's experienced HAPE or HACE before uh, preparing for another climb in altitude? Yep. So, you know, the key thing with HAPE is you want to make sure that you don't have an anatomic uh, disposition for it. And that anatomic disposition is basically um, a, for instance, decreased um, amount of blood flow to one of the pulmonary artery branches, right or left lung. And with that, an implicit overpressurization of one of the lungs and the pulmonary artery on that side versus the other. You know, there's been studies that have been described clearly with anomalies of the pulmonary arterial circulation that that was reliably a predictor for people who had that, that they would get repeat episodes of HAPE. You know, the discussion about HACE, HACE is really not felt to be necessarily clearly a um, dispositional factor, but rather sort of a end game of severe mountain sickness. But grant you, we don't know as much as we would like because these cases are in the first place rare. You know, when people have a history of high altitude cerebral edema, um, I usually try to talk to them and make sure that they never get to a place where they have mountain sickness in the first place. Because if we infer and suggest, as is currently the case, that high altitude cerebral edema is sort of the worst version of where mountain sickness can go, and if you prevent mountain sickness, you know, you decrease the likelihood of them getting sick from mountain sickness, be that by prophylaxing them with uh, Diamox or have pre-acclimatization strategies or ascent uh, speed strategies, then you will never get there. But this is a very individualized uh, decision and discussion because these disorders are rare and you know you want to not bar people who are not at increased risk to be able to climb mountains and enjoy themselves but you also don't want to tell someone oh it's going to be okay if there could be an anatomic underlying reason that could be discerned ahead of time and potentially at times even remedied all right i have a couple other questions that have popped up uh, with the possibility of developing pulmonary hypertension with extended exposure to hypoxia at altitude, do you know if there is a length of time at altitude that might result in irreversible remodeling? Good question. And that too, there is no easy answer to this. So there is a difference between reactive pulmonary arterial pressure increase um, commensurate and consistent with what your ambient oxygen is. So all of us, assuming we're healthy, you know, we have normal pulmonary arterial pressures, 25 um, millimeters of mercury. If we go up, you know, to let's say um, 15,000 feet and we would have a catheter placed to measure our pulmonary arterial pressures, they would all go up and that is normal. And, you know, that is a dynamic response to the environment. When things change is when you actually get in situations where people start developing chronic mountain sickness. So it's more in the direction of Monge's disease where they have then truly fixed pulmonary arterial hypertension. And the data as to how long people need to be at altitude, it's usually seen in 
native individuals that live at elevation over a prolonged period of time. So it's not the, you know, I um, moved to Aspen and now I'm at Aspen and now my pulmonary arterial pressures are increased. The thing that is important is that it's also confounded by other conditions that will influence your pulmonary arterial pressures, including alterations in breathing at nighttime with sleep. So sleep disorders are notorious for increasing pulmonary arterial pressures and causing right-sided cardiac remodeling courtesy of the swings, not just in pressure, but also the swings of, of oxygen and carbon dioxide causing some of this remodeling. So this has been a lengthy non-answer, not because I'm not keen to give you an answer, but there is none that I could easily tell you based on published data. Alrighty, another question we have is, should all headaches descend? How would you decide between someone being mildly dehydrated versus them developing AMS? Good question. So, yeah, some people can get headaches from high dehydration. Some people can get uh, migraines, you know, so not every headache on a mountain is mountain sickness. Um, but the difference will be that if you're getting a headache from dehydration, usually that can be remedied by just resting and hydrating. Um, and if it turns out that uh, you happen to have, um, for instance, a migraine and, you know, migraine triggered, you know, if you take your migraine abortive medicine that you're used to be working for you and it works for you, then odds are there was a migraine that was triggered. But if it turns out that none of the remedies that usually um, serve you and help you um, are improving the headache, you know, then you would have to assume that it's um, mountain sickness. Usually, you know, the scenario is one where people come into an environment, they usually don't suffer much from headaches, and now they go to a higher elevation um, uh, locale, and now they're starting to develop this pounding, uncomfortable headache that doesn't go away, irrespective of what they, whether they hydrate or they don't hydrate, and that would be, you know, then the sort of the hint that we're dealing with mountain sickness as opposed to something else. But, you know, that's um, a fair question and sometimes difficult to sort out. Any other questions? Yes, I was going to ask if you want to stay for a couple more minutes to answer. We do have a couple more questions. We have, uh, we have two more questions if okay. you would like to answer them. Please. Uh, so one of them is, if a person with a history of migraines more prone to the onset of AMS-related headaches and mild confusion when at relatively high altitude, uh, I lost my place for a second, um, and sudden barometric pressure drops when the storm rolls in, if this happens to this person sometimes when the weather changes, history of migraines. So... And this sort of gets us, you know, this is an innocent question that will be get, you know, a lengthy answer. So uh, what happens with migraines, you know, is that people who have migraines have a predisposition for more vasospasm. So their vessels tend to spasm, you know, be that due to ambient triggers and sometimes it's atmospheric triggers. Now, atmospheric triggers turn out to be pressure changes with low pressure systems when storms roll in. What that will beget, it will alter um, your breathing and as a result of that will alter your CO2 and as a result of that alter your sensitivity, how quickly your vessels are going to be likely to go into spasm. The very same thing for um, female um, individuals is around the period. You know, so when you know, it's notorious that um, women get migraines around their period. You know, that is due to the fact that it's high progesterone um, um, around their menstrual flow. And, you know, when you have high progesterone levels, it will increase your respiration, will drop your CO2 levels by about two to three millimeters of mercury, which in turn will put you in a state where you're more likely to experience vasospasm because that's what a relative hypocapnia will do. So, you know, if you happen to be a migraineur, you know, most people have migraines can actually um, travel and feel well at altitude as long as they follow the guidance of acclimatization or even preconditioning with some of these medicines that uh, we talked about and do so safely. 
you know, uncontrolled migraines or complex migraines where people, for instance, have a history of, you know, loss of function, you know, of um, uh, a part of their nervous system or loss of vision, you know, those are ones where you want to be specifically diligent and clear that um, they're well compensated and they're on a good regimen so they don't experience that when they're up on a mountain. And then the last question I have listed here, are there any specific types of mountain recreation that have been associated with higher or lower rates of AMS, HEP, HAC? Um, assuming that the assuming that the time to altitude may be the key factor here. Uh, that's a smart question. So, you know, the the ones that immediately come to mind clearly are going to be things like heli skiing. You know, when people are basically flown from their lodge to a very tall peak and then, you know, they're skiing down, you know, that obviously puts you at high risk. Um, but most of the data is really in the recreational mountaineering and climbing uh, domain. And it's really not so much climbing as much as it is trekking and mountaineering. That's where most of our data is from. And, you know, in those instances, I'm not aware that there is any differentiation based on type of sport, you know, that people are doing that would allow to say, ah, you know, this person is going to be worse off if they do this sort of sport in the mountains or at altitude versus this sort of sport. But, you know, time to um, altitude would be the key factor here. All right. And that is all the questions we have. Perfect. I hope that this was um, somewhere along the lines of what you guys were hoping for and um, appreciate the questions and appreciate the interest. That was thank awesome. You so thank much. you so much. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Stefanik. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Have a good night.